All right, so hopefully everyone's seeing this uh, title slide here of type safe APIs. What we're talking about is uh, a way to sync um, back and front end types and also just API calls in general um, using code generation. And the idea here is that as uh, applications have gotten more complex, uh, obviously uh, a consistent aspect of software development is complexity. Um, but as some of that complexity has moved more towards the front end and we get things like React and Angular, Vue and Svelte, uh, these um, frameworks where a decent amount of the complexity of software development now lives in the browser or on the client side, uh, we run into issues of uh, keeping consistency between backend code, what runs on the server and perhaps uh, informs APIs that then our clients need to call. We run into issues of keeping those two things consistent and knowing exactly what one uh, and, and one knowing exactly what the other is expecting. Uh, we struggled with this a bit a bit at Politico as we moved more towards these single page applications for our architecture. And then over the past uh, year or two, we're pretty happy with um, the solutions that we've come across, uh, which is what we're going to talk to you uh, or what I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, my name is Jack Coppa. I'm a lead front end developer at Politico. Uh, we happen to use Vue as our front end framework. We use a lot of TypeScript, um, do some shared components. Uh, I really enjoy working on front end uh, engineering or front end DevOps type of work, uh, which is where a topic like this comes from. A rough timeline of uh, what we're going to go through today. Um, and like was mentioned at the beginning, uh, please feel free to ask questions throughout. And I'll try to take some moments to pause throughout to just peruse, give you a break from uh, listening to listening to my voice um, and see if there's any questions that have come up so I can answer those. So I think roughly we'll be doing like uh, 10 minutes of content. I'll stop and peruse, see if there are any questions, and then we'll continue. We're gonna start with background, a uh, little bit of uh, how we got to where we are with data-driven single page applications or SPAs uh, being a common architectural practice for web applications and what pain points that causes. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about the remedy, uh, which is this type sharing uh, and how that can work with code generation. And then we wanna show, uh, oh, show some code and see what this looks like in practice uh, in an enterprise or pseudo enterprise um, environment. Something to keep in mind is this, uh, this is not required for everyone. For example, if you have, um, say you have a single page application, but it's relatively straightforward. Maybe it's just displaying one or two different UIs and you only have one or two different endpoints that you need to worry about. Uh, the overhead of, of, of uh, generating types to describe those APIs or, or generating methods, um, it may not be worth it, especially if you never find yourself being concerned about the front end knowing what the back end is doing and them getting out of sync. If that's not an issue for you, uh, then certainly no need to uh, no need to worry about this. I'm, I'd be honored if you uh, continued listening, but uh, uh, it, it's definitely not required for everyone. But as soon as there's a certain scale of perhaps calling multiple APIs, multiple different applications, or many different endpoints, and or having many different clients trying to call the same API. And if you ever find yourself thinking, I work on the front end code and I, I, I know my back end developers, but I, I don't typically work on the back end. And I often run into something where they've changed something and I wasn't expecting it, or I wanted to change something and, and they didn't know that I needed an update to the API. Uh, if you run into those types of questions, then that's where uh, this remedy section might be useful. Let's start with the background. Uh, and we're gonna do it as a, as a pseudo poll. Um, I have a couple questions and would love uh, for those uh, interested in responding to uh, just take some time to add quick answers into, uh, into the chat and I'll take a look at those in a bit. So the first is, have you worked with server rendered apps before? Um, so some examples of what that might be, uh, Rails, uh, .NET, Laravel, uh, Spring Boot or Java. Um, even something like, uh, like WordPress is also, you know, PHP in the same way that Laravel is, where uh, this was often the standard for uh, web application development um, uh, up to somewhat recently, where if you needed a web application UI, you would have a backend framework running code, uh, someone requests a page and the backend would render that thing. What that meant was that the, the UI code lived with the backend code. It was right next to each other. They were mashed together. Um, and, uh, and that meant that 
anytime you were changing things about complex data types, you know, those things live together. So that's question number one, you know, what, what, what type of uh, server rendered frameworks uh, or server rendered applications have you worked on in the past? And then number two, are you now or have you recently worked instead with uh, single page applications? Um, so obviously React being the big one uh, or Angular, Svelte, Vue, uh, Ember. Um, yeah, and then three, are you at all, and this is a bit of a leading question, but I'd be interested if you haven't had this experience as well, at all frustrated by having moved from a, you know, a server rendered application uh, environment to now perhaps a, a single page application uh, frustrated by the handling of data. So uh, getting data, posting data, uh, typing the complex objects that might be involved, maintaining complex objects, trying to keep track of when I'm making this request, does my object look like this or is it an array, that type of thing. So a sample response in chat could look like this. I've worked with .NET, um, you know, now I'm on React and I feel happy, I feel meh, or I feel sad <laughs> about the experience. Um, I'll take a look at that in a bit. The Politico background here is that uh, previously um, most of the Politico applications were uh, Java applications that rendered JSPs. So a, a Java uh, file where um, you took bits of data uh, and on the server decided, okay, here I want this dynamic data to go in the header and here I want this dynamic data to go in the sidebar. Whereas now uh, most of our, or all of our new applications are single page apps. So they call Java applications, but they call them through APIs and uh, we're using Vue on our front end. And uh, the leading question for number three, we were certainly uh, a little frustrated with this experience as things got more complex, uh, more complex with kind of a microservices architecture. Um, let's actually pause. I wanna take a quick look at chat um, just to make sure. Awesome, thanks for the responses from everyone. All right, so we see um, some yes, yes, uh, having worked with these before, some spring boot, some meh with the uh, experience of data between. Uh, oh, nice, I uh, have used uh, Swagger uh, generation, that's great, that's gonna be relevant here. Um, and then from Mark, <laughs> very, uh, <laughs> a little, little frustrated perhaps, uh, some tears, okay, cool. Um, so this is great, uh, ASP.NET and React uh, from Katie, that's great, that's very relevant here. Cool, so at, at least for uh, some of you, this is gonna be hopefully helpful. So when we think about being in this single page application environment, um, <clears throat> we're thinking about where does our data come from now? And then we're thinking about how is it documented? So who are, who's responsible, uh, sorry, which, uh, which application or, or which, um, uh, which repo, which people, which developers are responsible for the source of truth of your data. And so again, uh, if, if your data in your cap application is maybe just an object with one or two properties, uh, often you don't need to worry about this because it's pretty easy to keep it in your head um, uh, that when I call this endpoint, this is the thing that I'm gonna get. But what happens when, when you call an endpoint, you get an array of customers, and in that is an array of addresses, and next to that is an array of users associated with those customers, and next to that is the things that they subscribe to, and how do you access those? So uh, given that this is kind of a front-end engineering talk, what we're interested here in is the, the pain point of, I'm trying to interact with my data in my single page application, and I lose track of how to interact with it. I lose track of what the most recent state of it is. And I don't know if it's my job to keep track of that or if it's the backend's job, or I think what happens in a lot of organizations is uh, you have it duplicated. So like what happens when it changes, for example, the backend is now sending something different, um, but the front end was not aware that that happens. Often the answer to this question of what happens when it changes is it just breaks. And you know we don't know about it until a user sees that a page isn't working. So that's, that's a huge part of what we were trying to address at Politico. Um, the reason that uh, the reason that some some of this transition has occurred is that uh, when when server uh, when server rendered applications were the more popular approach uh, or or the standard approach is that um, you needed the resources of a server in order to render your application. So it meant that uh, if you were using the server to render your application, that uh, all the things involved with that data management lived right next to each other. They all lived on the server. 
then some things happened. And, and the biggest one is just that browsers got more processing power. Uh, and so obviously computers, <laughs> computers do that thing where they get more powerful over time. What that meant was that all of a sudden you had on a client side, your user, their browser had processing power that could actually do things for your application. You didn't need to, um, you didn't need to every time they landed on a new page for you to, for your server to do the work of rendering, for example, a user's profile page or um, a, a customer's uh, set of addresses or things like that. Um, it was possible for, uh, it became possible for browsers, clients, to start doing some of the heavy lifting, obviously, JavaScript. And, and uh, so we end up with things like Angular and React um, that, uh, that can now put the logic behind a web application experience um, into, or, or some of, yeah, some of the programming work into the front end. Um, so that's, that's this single page application where uh, you don't need to reload a page. Uh, you get to stay on a page. It looks like you're all on one page. Things happen quickly. Um, and this has also been really convenient for team breakdowns uh, for some specialization. At least on our end at Politico, we have, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a slightly fuzzy line, but we have a, we have a line between our backend developers who work on our APIs and our frontend developers who work typically in a view, JavaScript, TypeScript code base. This is great for specialization and being able to move quickly. It's less convenient for knowing uh, who's responsible for what happens um, when something changes. Uh, I love, uh, <laughs> like anyone, uh, love XKCD. And so this is, uh, this diagram here is tenuously related to what we're talking about, but uh, it shows the, uh, it does show a little bit of the pain point that we run into. So let's call this, this thing uh, there uh, that um, lots of things are interconnected. Um, it's very easy to create connections between those things, um, but uh, let's call it a let's call it a server monolith where everything lives together. And it would be really nice, like I mentioned with the breakdown of teams, it would be nice if the back end team could move separately from the front end team. Um, so we end up with something instead that looks like this, like single page applications with microservices, so that uh, our front end team can make a change to the view code without having to worry about what the backend team is doing or, or uh, you know, how those two things are going to be deployed. And the backend team can make changes before we even need to consume them. They can say, all right, I'm preparing this API for you in advance. So uh, that's the benefit of the microservices. And so uh, what we're talking about today is kind of in this, in this ideal area here where we want to we want the benefits of a, a microservices architecture where things are separated, easy to have differing uh, areas of expertise and people to work independently of one another, but to not struggle so much um, when we make changes separately from one another and, and, and don't know what the implications of those things are going to be. So we're looking for ways to keep our backend uh, code in sync with our front end code we'd like to do this while still getting the benefits of these single page application architectures. We're looking for ways to reduce the amount of duplication we have to make things more dry in a sense. If someone, if someone's application is complex enough that they need to annotate, when I have a customer object, it has an address and, and uh, it has a payment type and it has a set of users associated with that. If they need to add it, annotate that and they're doing it in both their backend code, whatever's on the server and in their, uh, front end application, then that quickly creates problems as soon as uh, you need to update things. And finally, we wanna know when things change, is something going to break? We wanna know what should I change when backend code has changed or uh, which new method should I use now that I'm updating my front end code? Um, and we wanna know this if possible, in an ideal world, we would know this before something breaks for our users. I would say that's something that, uh, 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 you can, of course, the, the goal is to have, you know, the testing pyramid in place for something like this. But what if, um, what if there's a way to catch some of these issues, maybe even a lot of them, uh, before the code ever makes it to the user? So that's where we're at here with this remedy, type sharing with code generation. Um, I'm going to pause briefly and take a look. I don't think there's been uh, further questions in the chat for now. And I also... 
Uh, let's see. I don't think I see any raised hands at the moment, so I think we're good for now. So I'm going to go ahead and keep going. Um, but please, uh, uh, please flag things in chat, um, and I'll try to pause to uh, to catch those as we go. <clears throat> what we're going to talk about uh, is a, a series of tools built to or designed to help solve this problem. And the first part of that tool chain uh, is an API specification. Um, we have a few different versions of what that might mean. Uh, so you may have heard of some of these. I think I saw it in chat, someone mentioned um, Angular uh, Swagger generation. So uh, there's a spec called Open API, and it's a uh, it's a specification like uh, like many others. It's uh, it takes the form of a JSON or a YAML file that says, for this API, here are its endpoints. Here is where you can post things. Here's where you can get things, and here are the types of objects involved with that API. Um, uh, you know, you can get back customer. You can input an address. These are the properties available on it. There's a couple of different specifications that describe something like this. There's Open API. There's Swagger, uh, which is closely intertwined with uh, Open API, uh, heavily related. There's Blueprint. There's RAML. Um, today, we're just going to be focusing on Open API uh, and the tool set uh, associated with that. But if you come away from this talk thinking that it's interesting that the tools discussed here and the workflows discussed here might be useful um, at your organization or on your team. Uh, know that you know there are options out there for you. Um, we happen to have enjoyed the tool chain associated with the Open API spec, um, but uh, yeah, there are options. So it's this API specification, and it describes the endpoints and, and the parameters and the responses. Um, it's useful for many things. Uh, what we're particularly interested in in this front end engineering track, uh, we're interested in how we can use it to keep our front end code in sync with our back end code when we're making HTTP calls. But there are other things uh, that this can be used for outside of HTTP. If you have two uh, microservices that need to communicate uh, with each other, maybe it's not over HTTP. It's in some sec separate environment. It's in Kubernetes, and they, they, there are ways for those two nodes to communicate. But they still need to know which endpoints they expose to each other. Um, you can use this specification for things like that. Uh, in our case, um, we, uh, we lucked into this a little bit, which is that we're feeling this frustration front end communicating to back end. And while looking for solutions, realized that our Spring Boot applications, so our Java applications, uh, we're already using a um, uh, we're already using a tool that generated their Open API specification. So in the case of Spring Boot, it's called Spring Fox. It's just responsible for generating this spec. But what's important to keep in mind, and, and maybe a, a way to gauge how easy this uh, would be to implement on your team, is thinking about one. Um, your backend team, uh, whether it's you or or other other team members, are they using a strongly typed language? So we've got C sharp, we've got Java, um, we've got plenty of others. Uh, if so, this is likely pretty easy. Um, and if even if they're not using a strongly typed language, are they already describing their API in some way? Uh, are they, do they already have a use for having a specification like this? where they're generating uh, as, as code updates. Maybe it's on continuous integration pipelines. Maybe they're doing it manually. But are they already generating a spec file like this? Um, and so for a lot of, uh, for a lot of uh, backend frameworks, there will be tooling already in place to use the types associated with the language or just use annotations um, and describe, here's what a get method is <clears throat> for this API. Here's, uh, here's this type of response. Um, the idea then is that uh, we no longer have to worry about duplication because the back end code, whatever lives in the back end, is the source of truth for both the endpoints that are available and the types that those uh, endpoints will expect and return. So we use this back end specification to then generate, uh, in our case, again, what we're interested in is clients to call the APIs. And those clients, um, in this case, uh, will be written in. Uh, they'll be written in TypeScript, um, but uh, very importantly here, kind of you know, to flag this right away, um, 
they will you'll benefit the most from these in an environment like VS Code, for example, which has a lot of TypeScript tooling in place. You don't need a project that's using TypeScript at all. Um, you can be using pure JavaScript in whatever your framework is. And just by virtue of being in an environment that understands TypeScript types, I'm sure a lot of us are already familiar with how this works. Um, you get the, uh, for example, IDE assistance um, that I'm gonna be demoing during the, during the demo portion. Um, so it's important to note uh, this, because we're interested in front-end code, it's going to be generating in TypeScript, um, but there are other generators available. And very importantly, while you might get more benefit if you're in a um, TypeScript code base, there's no requirement there and you will still get a benefit. Uh, and so that becomes the single source of truth for our front-end clients that call the APIs. We're gonna take a quick look um, at some of the some of what this tooling is. Uh, and obviously, you know, these links will be available um, uh, with the published presentation. Uh, we're gonna take a quick look at these. Before I click into them, I wanna make sure, uh, I think we're good on both chat and raised hands, cool. So I'm gonna, oops, I'm gonna click into first uh, the Open API Tools um, repo. Uh, mention this just because it's a really excellent example of um, really excellent example of an open source community that has uh, that has benefited many, many different developers and is managing a ton of different interests to try to create something that works for all of them. Um, the the key thing here is in this repo, uh, there are a ton of different generators. So generators being, I'm going to take one specification, the open API spec, it's JSON or YAML, um, and I can choose to generate whatever type of client I want. We're interested in the front end ones, but you can also generate C sharp clients to call the API or Java clients to call the API. And then from just the front end one, you can choose an angular specific, um, uh, you can use an angular specific generator. You can use a, uh, fetch like native window fetch generator. In our case, we use an Axios one because Axios was something that we were used to and enjoyed. Um, it has good Internet Explorer support. Um, but there are all these different uh, generators that are managed here that um, just by virtue of other people, obviously the wonderful way that open source works, other people using similar uh, tool chains can be bundled together here. Um, just uh, which which gives us a lot of flexibility options, regular updates. Uh, we really appreciate um, how this project has worked and been managed. And then one more thing, um, I see I mentioned the openapi generator.tech link, that's great. Um, feel free to check that out. Uh, this any API site, uh, I really like it as well because it's um, covering public APIs that follow an API specification. And it's a great example of this is, you know, just by using tooling available, Obviously, you don't have to make your API public, but you can see what that looks like um, for uh, uh, for what you know how how specific it's pot or, uh, it's possible to be extremely specific about what you're making available to consumers. So, just as an example, for the New York Times, they provide some API endpoints here. You can see what the endpoints are, and then you can click into them. And this is you know a UI version of uh, of their spec file. And so you see that when I'm making a request in this case to a content API, I have to tell it a limit and an offset. And then this is what I get back. Um, and so, uh, so what we're about to look at in code demo is, uh, the result of having this much information about what an API is providing to its consumers. I can see that there's going to be an object with results on that. There's going to be an abstract. There's going to be some multimedia. That's going to be an array of objects. A multimedia uh, object has a caption, a copyright, and a format. Um, so that's really what makes uh, this tooling possible. OK, um, we're about to get into some code. Uh, and so I think we're still good on the questions front. Thank you again to Stan for uh, linking the documentation site. And let's just go ahead and uh, let's let's pull this out. <clears throat> so um, a lot of the, uh, or at least some of the code we're going to be looking at here um, happens to be Vue. Um, but uh, 
it's really what we're interested in is is just the the javascript associated with it um, so you can imagine any front end code here where you can run javascript um, is uh is, is where this applies and let's take a look at my very bad demo app first see what it's providing for us um so just the this is just a base like create view app and i have two different uh types of apis that i'm calling one is one of those publicly available apis um, from that any api site and so it's getting new york times movie reviews let's take a look at uh, what this does let's go ahead and search for the irishman and there we have some results so it's making just a get request and it ends up looking like this so here honestly is, is what most of this talk comes down to it's how did this request get generated um, and if the new york times if for example if it's their team uh if the if the back end team decided that they wanted this api to have a new option or to deprecate an old option or to change you know change the path here be, to make it more consistent um how do we make this make this request to get uh, to, to get this information. How do we make that as maintainable as possible? So if we were, uh, if we were working outside the context of this talk uh, and, we, um, uh, and we just wanted, um, we, we just wanted a way to, to fetch, some, fetch some data, uh, I wonder if this is gonna work actually. Um, we would probably do something, oops, We'd probably do something like that, and it would uh, do const response equals fetch. Um, we'd probably type something like this in our code, uh, and I wonder if I can do response.json. Oops, maybe not. Um, but we'd we'd have something like fetch, and then we'd have this hard coded URL, or you know, maybe it'd be a little dynamic. We'd say like whatever the user typed here, put it in this spot. Uh, but we would just be typing out the string of this is where it is right now, but what happens if that changes in the future? Um, as it stands, uh, I'll just demo what this code looks like uh, here instead and what it's providing to us, um, uh, kind of the outcome here of, of this tooling that we're talking about, which is that instead of writing here, um, Um, instead of writing this, const response equals await, oops, await fetch, and then the URL, you know, it'd be something like that. Instead of writing that, um, I have this next line, which looks like this. There's no, there's no string here. There's no magic string about what the API endpoint is. Instead, we have this wonderful uh, constant here, which is the times movie API. And when we, uh, when we're doing a call to the times movie API and I type dot, I want to see what methods are available. I can see all the endpoints that are made available on the movie API. Okay. Um, and I can select one of them. And when I call it, I get to see uh, what that endpoint has made available, including this wonderful aspect that I also get to see the description that the Times has provided. <laughs> um, I get to see them describe what this API endpoint does, and I get to see, okay, it looks like it wants a query first, uh, then it wants potentially some other information. I'm seeing uh, this syntax here, which in TypeScript tells me that those are all optional. So I know that now I'm gonna start typing and all I need to worry about is passing in some kind of a query. Um, so this is this is sort of the the magic here, which is that this code, this reviews uh, review search JSON, um, is not uh, it's not something I need to manually update. It is provided because of the tooling that we have involved. Um, let's do um, pausing, making sure we're looking good. Oh, I actually uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pause briefly for a question from Justin. Um, let's see if. Should have more experience with this um, to shoot to try to unmute Justin. Um, oh, perfect! Thank you so much, um, Justin. Do you, did you have a question you wanted to ask now? No. 
Okay. Thanks, I appreciate the help with that. Uh, we'll come back and see if Justin has a, a question upcoming. Um, so this is the this is this is the magic here. And uh, in VS Code, um, we have a we have a nice uh, shortcut here. I'm just going to do F12, um, and that's going to navigate me to uh, where this is defined. And we see this crazy looking file, uh, which you can tell it's generated because no one would ever write uh, code that's this uh, this verbose and this well documented and this well defined. This lives in an API file. Uh, a uh, it's a you know a default API and it's got this method review search JSON get. This is the code that's generated by the Open API tooling. Uh, so let's go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna real quick. I'm gonna delete that code. Uh, let's let's move that to trash. And I'm gonna run a command um, which is responsible for generating. Um, uh, it's responsible for generating these clients. And we'll, we'll take a look at where that code runs. So it's generating an API client for my custom uh, API, uh, which is a candidate API, which we'll take a look at in a bit. And then it's going to go ahead and it's going to generate the API uh, for the, uh, it's going to generate the API client for this New York Times API as well. Um, the uh, the reason it's stumbling is because my candidate API is a free Heroku app that it often needs time to spin up. Um, in fact, let's verify that it is. Let's give it another shot there. Um, there we go. And so now it's generating the API client for Times Movies. So we have Times Movies back, and we can tell. Again, uh, this is generated code, and this is made possible because the Times publishes um, the spec of this API as an open API specification. This is uh, this is the code that um, that runs the generation, and it looks pretty much just like this. Um, and so, uh, a takeaway here um, from this presentation, if anything, uh, is that if uh, if you know NPM tools are something you're comfortable with or typically work with. Open API, the tools, uh, they export this um, generator uh, package, which is extremely simple to run. And all you need to do is point at some specification file, uh, some swagger.json in our case, uh, and tell it where it should output the results. You also tell it, this is the type of generator that I'm interested in. So that's all we're doing here is we're pointing at the uh, New York Times spec file. We can actually find it right here. Let's see what that JSON looks like going to be a little bit crazy. There's some JSON for you. Um, so this is the spec file. But all the tool needs to know is I'm going to point at that spec file, and I am going to output code uh, that, will, uh, that will allow anyone to call that API and do so in a type safe way. No things about the request and no things about the response. Now that we've shown that running, let's serve this again. Let's uh, get back to our initial state here. And let's see what happens. Uh, so, so we know we're calling the movie API, and we know we're, we're getting a reviews response. But what, in our case, so if we imagined we're doing things in this fetch way, um, we would also have to totally guess uh, what the response looks like. Whereas, in this case, we can do some movies equals, and we can do reviews response dot, and we get to see okay, this is what uh, this is the this is the structure of in our case the Axios response. So we want the data, and then we get to see what the New York Times has said a response for them is going to look like, uh, and so we can see that there's something like copyright number of results. That's not what we want. We actually just want the results, um, and uh, and and then we see oh. Uh, this isn't quite what we wanted for types because this is possibly undefined. Another wonderful example of uh, having these uh, TypeScript types in place as you're interacting with your APIs is you know um, that, uh, um, that I need to handle the case of what if it comes back and there are no results. And so then I'm just going to set it to be an empty array. Um, so this is what we've found at Politico to be a huge win for us, is that we no longer need to guess or maintain separately the documentation for, um, uh, oh, 
yes, sorry. Uh, I just noticed in the chat the um, uh, request for the GitHub repo. So let me, sorry about that. Yeah, please feel free to click around. Um, we no longer need to guess what the, uh, what the shape of our response is going to be. We can know what it's going to be because we have this uh, specification file that's telling us exactly what the request needs to accept and what the response is going to look like. Um, taking a look for any questions, I wanna jump into real quick the custom API um, that we're looking at that does a similar thing. So uh, let's take a quick look at that as well. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Totally right, Stephen. Appreciate it. Need to check my defaults. Uh, there's the link now to all attendees. Appreciate it, Stephen. Um, this uh, this is a bit of a, a bit of nostalgia that I left alone, which is that the the last time I talked about a similar topic um, was March, uh, <laughs> and uh, given that everything has felt a little bit frozen in time, I've just left the data alone here. Uh, for uh, a lot of this just total dummy data, but given that I work at Politico, um, felt like it made sense for a, uh, um, for a campaign related uh, API. And so all this does is it allows you to save information about some candidate um, and, uh, and then view the information that has been saved and also, um, also uh, remove the ones that you no longer want to be displayed and it's a, it's a Spring Boot application, so there's a database back there. So I've, I've deleted it and it's gone. And let's create another sample person. Um, and we're gonna add them, and now they're added. So again, if we were creating this app without any uh, infrastructure in place for uh, syncing backend and front-end types, we would need to know uh, how do I create a new person and what's expected uh, when I create a person. And then also when I want to get people, what is the shape of them? Is it, is, it just a, is it just a string that says the person's name or do they have a name and they also have a party and they have an election cycle? Uh, is it first name, last name or all one field? And so uh, in a similar way to what we would have done with the Times API, um, we would have had to guess, uh, we would have had to guess previously when we're calling the API, um, what the what the shape of it should be. Instead, now we can uh, import a candidate API. So it looks kind of like this. We're just doing new candidate API and here is our generated code. So yep, as always, uh, once it once you can tell that it looks like a ton of effort was put into it, then you know that that's not code that I wrote. Um, and we can call the API to do things like add a candidate. Uh, and here is where so so up to this point, everything that we've been seeing in the IDE, um, so in VS Code, works equally well in a JavaScript project and in a TypeScript project. You know, it'll tell you, uh, it'll tell you things like this because there are TypeScript definitions. But what's really wonderful is if I do, say, uh, say what it had originally been when I was defining a candidate is that instead of first name last name, um, instead it was just name and it was, you know, the default was, was an empty string. If this had been the original and the backend decided that in order to keep this in sync with our other objects, uh, we really need to split it out to a first name and a last name. And they made that change, but they made that change separately from us. It was on another project. Uh, they're trying to keep things consistent. We're trying to update our code. The ability to move quickly and separately is great, but they made the change and we never heard about it. What would happen is, you would deploy your application, the backend would deploy their application, and the first time that you would know something's wrong is that the page no longer loaded. Perhaps you have tests in place to catch this, or perhaps it's just manual testing and that a user is going to tell you that something broke. But here's where having TypeScript in your pipeline uh, becomes really nice, which is that when I press save on this file, um, and, uh, and let's see here, uh, I need, Oh, let's go ahead and restart this. Uh, when I press save on this file, I am going to get yelled at. Um, and that is the part that this tool chain, uh, as integrated into our infrastructure, 
um, at, uh, at Politico has really helped us because as soon as I run a command to update um, and get the latest API clients, I'm going to get whatever the latest uh, objects are, whatever the latest expectations are. And if, they, if backend has changed from name to first name, last name, I'm going to get yelled at and it's going to fail before it finishes building. And so that, um, I, you know, I'm sure you've heard that lesson of TypeScript in, in other talks. And this is essentially just extrapolating that lesson of TypeScript to data management by sharing types between front end and back end. Um, but that uh, you'll get failure messages like this before your code ever gets deployed, before it gets deployed to a QA environment or a staging environment or to prod, because the build will just fail and it'll tell you this expectation that you previously had about how this was going to work is no longer true. And so you then go ahead and fix it and say, ah, it's first name, last name now. You know, I can see that by investigating. If I want to see what the type of candidate is, I can see that uh, you know, I can see that it has a first name and a last name. And then uh, as you make that change, then your build will be allowed to succeed. And uh, you'll, um, you'll be able to make those requests to add a new person, uh, for example. Um, that is primarily uh, the lesson that we've learned at Politico is this, this um, approach that uh, no longer do we need to manually sync our front end code, both the, the destinations of our API, API endpoints, the types of requests that they accept, and the responses to be able to interact with these complex objects. No longer do we need to maintain those separately in two different places. Um, we can instead have the back end be a single source of truth, uh, which is wonderful. I want to cover one thing real quick, um, which is how we do the generation, um, which is that uh, um, which is that the simplest way to get started with this, if any of this has sounded interesting to you, is that you have a, you have a client and it's calling an API and you've worked with your backend team uh, to enable, and, and perhaps if, you know, if they're using a framework, there's a good chance their specification already exists, but you've worked with them to enable the specification. How do you get this TypeScript code? The answer is that if you're just calling one API and you want to try this out on one client, in the client, you'll go ahead and run a command like this. And again, these, uh, these slides will be available. Um, you'll run a command that looks like this. Uh, open API generator, npm package, generate, and point at the API swagger JSON. Uh, that's what we're doing um, in this demo project. We're running in the view app, we're generating the, the API files, um, and we're committing those so that um, then when, uh, um, when, we, when we build and deploy these, it can call those API files. As you grow and try out and experiment um, with this workflow in other places, you might end up in a situation that looks more like this. And you have multiple clients calling one API, or you have a client calling multiple APIs, or, or you have a combination of, of the two, like we do at Politico, where we have many APIs and many clients, and they're calling in different ways so that they can get the benefit of uh, being developed in isolation. In this case, it's going to become frustrating for client one to run a generation command and client two to run a generation command and client three to run a generation command and for them to each be committing this generated code. Uh, as we know, it's kind of a code smell. And so I just wanted to point out that uh, what we've discovered as, as this workflow has developed for Politico is that we run in the API, we generate it locally, and then we publish it as an NPM package. Um, and I'm really happy to you know, reach out, uh, please reach out to me um, uh, here in the chat or on Twitter, um, really happy to discuss what this workflow looks like for us. But this is really what's allowed us to um, scale this to our various microservices and our various applications because each API now publishes, every time it runs on CI, if there's updates, it publishes an NPM package so that client one and client two and client three, they can just install you know, API TypeScript package. Um, and that's a way to have this uh, single source of truth improved even further, I would say. Um, that was a lot. I think, uh, I think we're good in terms of questions. Um, the, obviously the presentation will be shared and the, the repos in the chat. Please reach out to me um, on, uh, uh, on Twitter, um, Jack P. Kappa there. Find me on GitHub. I'm really happy to discuss this. We've really enjoyed having this workflow in place at Politico, uh, and we hope it can be useful for your organization as well. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>